make my life so beautiful And as you are, you have made me There's nothing greater than me That's why I love you forevermore You made my life so beautiful And as you are You have made me here now There's nothing greater
today. Hallelujah. And I will be bringing us into the part two of the fellowship of our calling. Understand um, the fellowship of your calling. And I won't go back to the last previous meeting we have. But I think it's important for everyone who is in the work of the ministry to understand the importance of the epistles and then importance of the doctrines of Christ. Uh, if you are going to be an effective minister in the vineyard of God, you must get a clear picture of who Christ is and the assignment you are given in the New Testament. And I think that is the key. If anyone will, uh, will walk uh, in the ministry and we last. It is not just a spontaneous reaction. Uh, there must be a doctrine, not, there must be a doctrine, uh, a structure of the doctrine of Christ that we must consume and receive for our own personal growth. There is no uh, Bible growth in the absence of teaching. Uh, there is no how we are going to measure the growth of a minister, of a Christian outside the revelation of what Christ has done. And one of the most tempting areas is trying to grow up in Christ without involvement of the grace of God. You see, when we try to grow up without the input of the man of grace, the grace himself, then our growth becomes fake because the Bible says that no man will glory in his presence. So, um, having the understanding, I will lay emphasis on the importance of sound doctrine, Bible doctrine, the doctrine of the New Testament, so that we can stay within that course and do something powerful for Jesus. So, we'll read First Timothy chapter 4, the, the letter of Paul to Timothy, uh, one of the or let me say the, the most trusted sons of Paul in the ministry work. As far as Paul is concerned, Timothy happened to be the most trusted son. So he wrote him a letter because as at that time, Timothy also has become a bishop uh, in a local assembly. So now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirit and doctrines of the devil. Now, there are three important things that scripture analyzes. One, departing from the faith. And the departing from the faith is just the result of giving heed to seducing spirit and the doctrines of the devil. If a man is preaching the doctrines of the devil and is listening to seductive spirit, then eventually he has departed from the faith. So, being departed from the faith produces the fruit of giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of the devil. In, in, in the course of time, I will show us the doctrines of the devils which is now available in our time. And if a man does not understand Christ and he does not understand the scripture, there is possibility that he shipwrecks his faith that he has once confirmed. The faith that he has confessed about Christ, about resurrection, and uh, it will not be funny that people are departing from the faith. And, uh, and that faith the scripture is talking about um, is not just faith to obtain uh, blessings and miracles. That faith as our way of life. So departing from the faith means there is a way a Christian is constructed in Christ to behave. And once we begin to depart from the faith, we begin to change our way of life. And then having listened to and um, giving attention to seducing spirit and the doctrines of the devil. I will still come back on this, but I just want us to read the entire uh, chapter for proper understanding. Let's look at verse 2. Verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. He's still talking about the fruit of a man of God or a Christian 
who has departed from the faith. If a man has departed from the faith, from our way of life, from the revelation of Jesus that has produced a life in us, there is a way of life that we have received through revelation. So when a man departs from that faith, and the Bible says he begins to speak lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Uh, that, that simply means over a long period of time, and they've, they've, the, the life of a godly conscience uh, is forever dead. Verse 3. Verse 3, forbidding to marry. Those are part of the doctrines of the devil. And commanding to abstain from myths. That is also in trying to be more holier. And they begin to put themselves in unnecessary discipline that is not within the context of salvation. Which God had created to be received with thanksgiving of them, which believe and know the truth. Verse 4. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Verse 5, and let's read fast. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Hallelujah. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, you shall be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the word of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. And what that's very important. Paul was saying that if you begin to put brethren to remembers of these things, that you'll be a good minister. And but refuse profane and old wives' fables. Fable means stories. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Verse 8. For bodily exercise profited little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is worth. To come. So we see two fruit of godliness there. One, the godliness, please go back to verse 8. The godliness deals with the present life and that which is to come. Hallelujah. The godliness deals with our work with God in this present life and also our position in God, with God in the life to come. So it covers two areas. Godliness covers two areas. It focuses on our work with God in the now realm, then also after this earth. Verse 9. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all one. As I so he was writing the letter to Timothy, that what I'm sharing with you is a faithful statement and it's also worthy of all accept. That is, everyone that is around you within the local church should accept this as a faithful statement and it is also worthy of emulation and acceptation. Verse 10. Uh, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So therefore the responsibility of Paul the apostle and together with all his son Timothy is that they have to labor. Are you hearing me? They have to labor to reveal the truth about Christ. They labor to present the doctrine of Christ unto the local churches. And that is where our labor comes from now. Our labor is not um, to show ourselves because we do not preach ourselves. We preach Christ the revealed Christ, the glorified Christ. So we are going to labor in the word, in the word of God, to bring out truth from scripture and present it to people. That is where our labor comes from. And this is very fantastic. So that's why I say, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Verse 11. Uh, these things command and teach. Okay. Shall we read it again? Let no man despise what your youth, but be thou an example of believers in what? In word. Somebody say in word. Then conversation, a way of life. 
in charity which is given in spirit, in faith, in purity. Verse 13. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exaltation, to doctrine. To reading. Till I come and visit you, make sure that you give attention to reading, to exaltation, to doctrine. Hallelujah. Verse 14. Neglect not the gift which is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Those are the elders. Hallelujah. And um, verse 15. Meditate upon these things. Upon what? Upon the truth. Give yourself wholly to them, that your profiting may appear to all. Now, this is where we have issue. Now, if a man is called by God, must not assume that he knows everything about the ministry. The Bible says if you want your profiting to appear unto all men, you must give attention to reading, to meditate upon the truth. Upon the truth. And it's not just the truth. Truth is Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is the truth. The essence why the Holy Spirit has come after Jesus has left is for the Holy Spirit to reveal unto us more truth about Christ, the Son of God. Because the Holy Spirit does not have any other ministry than to reveal Christ unto us. Remember when Jesus was talking about him, he said whatever he hears from the Father, he will speak to us. So the Holy Spirit does not have a ministry of his own. The Holy Spirit comes to reveal Christ unto us, to comfort us about the revelation of Jesus, to strengthen us about the revelation of Christ. Everything the Holy Spirit will do in this testament, it will be pointing to Jesus. And everything we will do as ministers of the gospel must be pointing to Jesus. Because if we are not doing something pointing to Jesus, it's not a ministry. If we are not doing something pointing to Jesus, it's not a ministry. It may be a business or it may be something different. But the Holy Spirit himself, the Spirit of God, will always reveal Christ unto us and point us to Christ. Because Jesus is the glorified Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus is what? The glorified Christ. That simply means the risen Lord. Jesus is the glorified Christ, the reading law. So the Holy Spirit will reveal him to us so that we can glorify him. Hallelujah. Jesus said in John 17, he said, glorify thy son and thy son will also glorify thee. So this is the time that the ministry in the New Testament is not pointing to any man. It's pointing to Christ revealing Christ, establishing the revelation of Christ in our heart so that when Christ is lifted up and he will draw all men unto himself. The drawing of all men unto himself is predicated on pointing Christ, pointing people to Jesus. And that is where exactly the true revival will come from. The true revival is the revelation of Jesus shifting the focus of people from us and pointing them to Christ. That is where the revival of this end time will begin from. It will not begin from the demonstration of the spirit capacity. It will not begin from uh, outpouring of giftings and the anointing. It will begin by drawing people to Christ shifting focus from us so that when we begin to meditate upon the truth of the word of God, our profiting may appear unto all men. Verse 16. Verse 16. Take it. Now listen to this. Take it unto yourself and unto the doctrine. Take it to yourself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will both save yourself and those that are worth. So to be able to save yourself as a minister of the gospel, if you are not going to go to hell, or you will not fall by the wayside, 
there is a prescription the word of God gives us. He said we should take it unto uh, the doctrine. Take it unto yourself first. Examine yourself, your status, the status of your faith level, and also take it unto doctrine. Let's look at this scripture in other translation. I think it might help one or two people because I really want to speak about the essence of the doctrine of the Bible before because we place the manifestation of the things of the spirit above the doctrine of the Bible. So we have a lot of lousiness without depth. We see a lot of demonstrations without character. We find a lot of manifestations that are not rooted. Why? Because every manifestation of the spirit cannot be rooted in a man that does not establish in the doctrine of Jesus. So watch yourself and watch your teaching. Keep on doing these things because if you do, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Other translation, uh, keep a firm grasp. Look at scripture. Keep a firm grasp on both your character and your teaching. Don't be diverted. Just keep at it. Both you and those who hear you will experience what? Salvation. Hallelujah. Other translation. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who that hear you. Do we have any other translation? This is exciting. Look well to yourself, to your own personality, and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. Hold to them. For by so doing, you will save both yourself and those that hear you. Now, this is the first thing uh, our generation, especially the young ministers and the upcoming ministers, we make a lot of noises about manifestations of the anointing and power, which is good. But if the manifestation of the anointing and power finds a man that is not rooted in the doctrine of scripture, then that manifestation will kill him. Because all manifestations of the power and the anointing brings pride when you are not rooted in the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of Christ is the platform for all demonstration of the spirit and power. And that is why most people don't have understanding of what Christ has come to do before they jump into ministry. And you will begin to see a lot of legalism and then um, we find human works, then we find the strength of human and, and trying to pioneer uh, a ministry. So I will bring you into a very strong understanding today. And I think that is going to be of a tremendous help to someone in Jesus' name. 2 Timothy chapter 3 from verse 10 to 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's read from verse 1. We are reading scripture because it's important. 2 Timothy chapter 3 from verse 1. Give us KJV. And I want you to look at it very important. We are teaching sound doctrine. And they, that is cast in our own time. And our ministers attend to manifestations of the Spirit without being rooted in the doctrine of Christ. And because we are not rooted in the doctrine of Christ, we are not stable. And then we are carried away by all kinds of the wind of doctrine. Look at what Paul the Apostle wrote, part of the letter he wrote to Timothy. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall what? Shall come. Okay, verse 2. For men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemer, disobedient, apparent, unthankful, unholy. Let's read further. Without natural affection, truth breaker, false accuser, incontinent, fears, despiser of those that are good. Um, verse 4. Traitor, healthy, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than the lovers of God. Let's continue, please, fast. Uh, having a form of what? Godliness, but denying what? The power thereof. Remember, what? godliness carries power. And when we talk about the power of godliness, the power of godliness is to have an accurate representation of Christ, the manifestation of his nature at work in us. That is the power. It's not the power to fall under the anointing. The Bible is referring here. 
Hallelujah. The power of godliness is the power to be the exact representation of Christ on the earth. So that when people see you, you are the living epistles. Hallelujah. Because you are written in their heart. So people will look at you and you will be an answer. Hallelujah. They will look at your life and they will look at that life of Christ. There is power that brings that godliness into manifestation. It's not a form. Hallelujah. It's not a legal, legalism. It's not a form. It's a power. Because form cannot produce the power. So having the form of godliness look like a Christian, but by the time we get closer to him, we find out that the nature of Jesus is not manifesting in him. The power the scripture is now talking about is the power of transformation, which is very scarce in the life of a lot of people that claim that they are manifesting spirituality. You imagine somebody prophesying and then speaking pro prophesying that he could not bring his body under subjection. You imagine somebody claims that he sees vision, that he has no control over money. You imagine that somebody who prays for a long hour and then is a victim of pornography. So they have a form. That having the form becomes the problem of our generation. We have a lot of form of godliness, but there is no proof of it. There is no transformation. That form is... A lot of people enter into ministry through that form. A lot of people go to Bible school through that form. Some people are attain the place of ministers in the church through the form. But having checked them out, there is no dunamis. There is no divine, there is no power that brings about transformation in their life. Then the Bible says, from such, turn away. From such do what? Turn. Because if you don't turn away, having the form is contagious. Verse 6. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, leading with sin, led away with diverse laws. Verse 7. Ever learning and never able to come what? To the knowledge of truth. So truth has knowledge. Because revelation is the walking knowledge of truth. Somebody say Revelation is the working knowledge of truth. So ever learning, but they have never come to the knowledge of truth. That truth that we have to come into understanding of it is what actually brings the power of godliness to manifestation. When you come to the knowledge of truth, the knowledge of truth produces power in you to change. And you can see somebody can come to Bible study for the next 30 weeks. Hallelujah. And he's learning. But he has not come into position. He has not come to the revelation. He's still learning, but there is no revelation that could process a change on his inside. Verse 8. Okay. Now as James and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt mind. Someone is a corrupt mind. Now, let me stay here for a while. Now, the corrupt mind, everybody look at me. This is a very important statement I'm about to make. And for you, if you are watching online, don't leave that online now. Just pay attention to a very important statement I'm about to make. You see, when we become born again, we are a new creation. We are a new man in Christ. But the essence of reading the scripture, knowing the doctrine of the Bible, is to protect our mind from demonic interaction. Satan interacts with mind that is not filled with the word of God. Even though he's born again. Even though you are born again. Even though you are praying in tongues. Even though you are spirit filled. If the word of God does not interact with your mind, the devil takes advantage of lack of revelation and he begins to interact with the mind until that mind is corrupted. Now, the corrupt mind simply means a mind that carries wrong information about life. Mind that carries wrong information about life. Because the interaction the Holy Spirit has with us is that through the word of God, our mind is renewed on a daily basis. 
And when our mind is renewed with the word of God, the renewing of the mind is the breastplate of righteousness that covers our heart from being corrupted by wrong interpretation. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the Bible says that men of corrupt mind reprobate concerning the faith. That simply means that if you are reading the entire Bible, it is possible to be reading scripture with a corrupt mind. It is possible to bring out interpretation to your advantage. It is possible to mess up the reality of the word of God. The faithfulness of God's word is being misinterpreted because your mind is corrupted. And what corrupts the mind is the interaction of seducing spirit with a mind that is not covered by revelation. So if you are born again and you are in the work of the ministry and there is no money in your pockets and then a lot of things, you are going through a lot of things, it will take you the renewing of your mind not to preach a message that will bring money to your pocket. Why? Because Satan loves to interact with mind that are not covered by revelation knowledge. So the essence why we study this scripture, why we bury our head in the word of God and to be very strong and sound in the doctrine of Christ is that when the devil brings something different from scripture, we have developed a strong mind, which is the mind of Christ. Sound mind. Hallelujah. Sound mind. Mind that is sound. So that every time we go into scripture with a sound mind, we bring out the revelation of truth. Hallelujah. And that revelation of truth will help us first before it helps other people. The Bible says, in doing this, so that you and those who are hearing you will be preserved. Now, the, this is very important because even a preacher can destroy the member. A preacher and member could be destroyed in the same local church. Now, if a man of God's mind is corrupted, then it brings a corrupted interpretation to the members. And because the distribution of, uh, of, of spiritual food comes through the teaching of scriptures. So by the time I'm teaching you right now, what you are receiving is coming from a mind, hallelujah, that has been sound, buried in scriptures. So the interpretation is not according to my advantage or it is not according to my advantage. It's the truth that I'm presenting to you from a sound mind. So if a mind is not sound, it will be corrupted. And if a mind is corrupted, it's a reprobation concerning the faith. It therefore means that the man will not change. That is what they will continue to teach. Hallelujah. For 365 days, for God's sake, a pastor is teaching about money alone. And thinking that the abundance of what you possess is in the numbers of the cows and the houses. Hallelujah. And that is the problem we are having now. A young minister who has just started the gospel and I eventually has fallen into the hands of seducing spirit. Seducing spirit, spirit that deceives. Seducing spirit is interacting with a mind to produce corruption. Sound mind, the Holy Ghost interacts with a sound mind through the word of God to present truth to people. So where do we get the truth we preach? We get it through the fellowship with the Holy Ghost. Because if we don't fellowship with him, truth will not come into our mind, then if it doesn't come into our mind, it will not people will not receive it. Hallelujah. It doesn't have to be popular, but it must be scriptural. And the second important thing is that, that part of the revival that is coming is that truth will be presented within the context of scriptures. We will not bring out scriptures out of the context and apply it for our own advantage. That is the revival of the fear of God. So the fear of God is staying within the authority of scriptures and don't give scripture a voice where it is silent. That is the fear of God on the part of a man of God speaking scripture. Now for a man of God who operates in the fear of God, it simply means that it will not amplify, it will not bring into authority what the scripture has not said. That is where the fear of God lies in us. 
Because by the time we are standing in the office of a pastor or teacher or evangelist, people hold us into high esteem. And in this generation, they believe what you say more than what the Bible is saying. So it is very important that we come into scripture and we come with serious understanding without making unclear statements. The reason why believers are not growing is because they are feeding on unclear statements. They are feeding on quotable quotes. Quotable quote is not going to grow you up. You are not going to grow up through quotation. You are not going to grow up through nuggets. It is not wisdom nugget that grows a man. What grows a man is the sound doctrine, the wholesome word of God within the context of scriptures. That is the real growth because that growth will last. That is why I tell people it is difficult for you to endure sound doctrine because it's not appealing. It's not exciting. It's not fun fair. It doesn't carry noise. It is a life transforming power that enters into the life of those who hear it and they are changed. As we behold him with an unveiled face like in a glass, we are transformed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of God. So now, the work of the ministry is not compulsory, it is popular, but you have to be thorough. You have to understand, if you don't know a subject, for God's sake, don't preach it. And how do you know? Go and sit down and learn it. For a subject of the Bible, enduring sound doctrine is very difficult. No, you know the reason? Because we begin to compare spiritual things with spiritual things. We begin to bring out the reality of scripture. One scripture interprets another scripture. Another scripture explains other scripture. Nobody has time for that anymore. So what we'll do is to cook stories together, fables, and bring them excitement, word of men, experiences of men, and then the wisdom of men, package it together and turn it to message. And people are excited. They are not growing. You are not growing. Eventually, a pastor who feed from a corrupt mind will destroy himself and that members. And that's the problem we are having. But if we have made up our mind to do the work of the ministry, we must understand that it is more than praying. And that's another thing that is very, very serious now. And, you know, people just take break to go for prayers. And then the man who has gone to pray comes back to the church and begin to share experiences. Experiences is not going to feed you. It's the word of God. The word of God is going to strengthen you, build your faith, and give you inheritance among those who are what? Sanctified. Let's look at verse 9. Are you following me? This is not exciting. Hallelujah. But they shall proceed no further, for their foolish shall be made manifest unto all men, as they are also. also. Verse 10. But thou as fully, now look at scripture. Now, Paul was telling Timothy, you know, Timothy is the most trustworthy son of Paul. So Paul wrote a letter to Timothy and said, from the interaction I have with you from the father and son mentor relationship, thou as fully known my what? My doctrine. Manner of life. Somebody said doctrine. Now let's look at those things that the ministers of God must learn from their fathers. Because what a lot of people learn today is not even blessing them. So thou hast fully known what? My doctrine. So Paul the Apostle said, Timothy, the first thing he has learned is my doctrine. Also what? Manner of life. Manner of life. Manner of life simply means way of life. Number three, uh, my purpose. The reason why I enter into ministry. The fourth, faith. Hallelujah. The fifth, long suffering. What I have endured for the sakes of the gospel, my charity, my ability to give to men, and what? My patience. Hallelujah. My patience simply means I have to wait for you until you grow up. I've got to wait for you until you grow up. So now let's look at this very important. Uh, he said, Timothy, in the ministry work, these are the things you must understand, which you have understood. So he was reminding him. But thou hast fully known my what? My doctrine. Somebody said my doctrine. What is my doctrine? Doctrine means teaching. Sound doctrine means wholesome teaching. 
doctrine means teaching sound doctrine means wholesome teaching you must understand the difference between the two doctrine means teaching sound doctrine means wholesome complete teaching hallelujah wholesome healthy teaching now you know that there could be food that is not healthy uh, if you cook rice four days ago and you are still eating it today that's not healthy hallelujah praise the lord so he said you are fully known my uh my doctrine paul the apostle obtained his doctrine from the revelation of jesus nobody taught him things he spoke they were the revelations that christ taught him so he said i do not only have teaching i also have manner of life and this is very important a lot of people just celebrate um, the knowledge but there is no manner of life there is no way of life that correspond the doctrine because doctrine will produce a way of life doctrine sound doctrine will produce a way of life if the word of god you are teaching people is edible strong and powerful it will transform them now you are not to transform i can't transform my members but they can only be transformed when they receive sound doctrine that sound doctrine is an interaction with their spirit are you hearing me sound doctrine is an interaction with their spirit to form christ in them the bible says he said my children whom i travail in bath until christ be formed in you so christ is formed in us through the teaching of scripture through the teaching of christ christ is formed in us when the heart of the hearers is unveiled their heart is their eyes the eyes of the understanding receives the revelation of jesus you see there is tendency we point people to us that's anytime teaching is focusing on us it's a diversion in the spirit every time teaching is focusing on you it's a diversion every time it's focusing on christ is an impartation so when men focus on christ they have a direct impartation from the spirit of truth and that is that that's the big truth so thou hast fully known my doctrine that is my teaching what i believe in this gospel according to my gospel he was telling them he said christ raised from the dead according to my gospel so the gospel that god gave unto paul which is the gospel that on giving access to the gentiles to come to the knowledge of salvation that gospel is correct real sound established and balanced so he brought timothy up through that gospel he raised him through that gospel he fathered him through that gospel paul the apostle was not giving anything for timothy he was not feeding timothy outside the context of scripture unlike we have today that what we call father and son's relationship is not the revelation of christ it's just the revelation of that man of god hallelujah which is not a correct fathering a correct fathering is unveiling christ to people so that they can be grounded and rooted in scripture but what we have in africa fathering mentoring relationship is that one man will raise himself higher then he begins to give all kinds of rules and those rules he begins to give he is even more important than christ in the long run so the relationship makes him a boss for others to be a slave and then even what christ has become unto them he make them to forget and he put himself as a replacement for the image of jesus and that is witchcraft that is um i know africa like to idolize and things that scripture does not support but i was known my doctrine manner of life that is a way of life that the doctrine of christ produces you know am i speaking to us that is a way of life that the doctrine of christ produces in us purpose faith somebody say faith now that faith is faith of the son of god faith of the son of god for the righteousness of god is revealed from faith of faith there is a faith that the righteousness of god uh,
came into revelation through that faith. There is a dimension of faith that brings the righteousness of God to us. The righteousness of God is revelation. But faith brought it into existence. That is to say, I believe that Jesus is Lord and I believe he died for my sin. And the Bible says you are saved. And the Bible declares you righteous. Hallelujah. So the faith that brings that righteousness into manifestation is the righteousness of faith. Is revealed. The righteousness of God rather. The righteousness of God is now revealed in us. Hallelujah. Say so the righteousness of God is revealed in me because I believe in Christ. So that righteousness was hidden in Abraham until Christ came. Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted to him for righteousness. But now that the righteousness of God was hidden in Abraham and we are Abraham's seed. Hallelujah. So in Christ, we are made righteous because Jesus has done everything and we believe in what he has done and therefore we are righteous. So that faith is also what I believe. Long suffering. I suffer long. I endure a lot of pains just to bring the truth across to people. And that is long suffering. The long suffering is not that I am hungry because uh, I didn't walk. No. But I had long suffering because I needed to go through a lot of trials to communicate this truth. And that is the long suffering the kingdom has set. That is, you are communicating truth to people and then you went through a lot of issues. The Bible said, I wanted to come to you. Paul said, I wanted to come to you, but Satan hindered us. So that hindrance, Satan hindered them. It's not that, you know, Satan is not going to hinder you because you are traveling for wedding ceremony. Satan is not going to hinder you because you are doing the burial of your mother. No? The road safety may hinder you. But when the Bible says Satan hindered them, Satan hindered them so that the truth of the gospel cannot be revealed to them. That's why Paul said if our gospel is hidden, it is hidden to those who are perished, whom the God of this world has blinded their mind, lest the light of the glorious gospel, you understand, dance in their heart. So you must understand that the greatest contention you will have is that he doesn't want you to know anything. Satan just wants you to move on, pray in tongues, roll under the power, move everywhere, jump, do all kinds of things. But when it comes to truth, it will hinder you. When it comes to things that were formed Christ in you, strengthening you on the inside. When it comes to the things that will transform your life, he likes you being having a form of godliness. Having a form, you know, having a suit and tie. Then there, there are languages you, you hijack, you borrow. It's still a form. Coatable coat is still a form. It's still a form. Wisdom nugget is still a form. By the time the power of God, the power of godliness is made manifest, the search to know God comes to an end when people see you. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Because you will be pointing exactly to them. You are the ambassador of Jesus. Representative of Christ. You've been given ministry of reconciliation. The works I do, you will do. What works? Jesus reconciled men. You reconcile men back to him. You didn't die for men, but you are giving a ministry, pointing them to Christ. And as you are pointing them to Christ, they are getting saved. That is the ministry you have. So we will see Peter when he healed the lame man at the beautiful gate. And the people are looking at him. He said, it's not us. Don't stop looking at us as if we are the one who raised this guy. He said, the Lord Jesus you crucified is the one who raised him. He pointed them back to Jesus because the ministry of reconciliation will point people to Christ. That is the ministry we don't have now. The ministry we are having now is the ministry of the gifts that is pointing people to us. You see, gift is just a sign that you point people to Christ. But the gift of the Spirit, the demonstration of the Spirit, social media, and all media platform, mostly is pointing people to us and not to Christ. And when there is no ministry pointing people to Christ, you are out of the New Testament expression, no matter what. So, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, 
giving and what patience patience means i've got to wait until you grow up so a young minister a minister of the gospel we have to be patient with people until they also do it. that patience is not that looking at the devil to destroy your life that patience is the interaction you have with people so that you continue to feed them you know the way you feed your children and out of 10 spoon and six of them pour out you remember you know when you can you can feed a child that part of out of the 10 spoons of rice and then the child weighs about four spoons you keep on feeding until there comes a time when you will see that the child is what is filled up and then he sleeps then he wakes up again he cries for hunger and they cries for food then you continue feeding that feeding is where our patience is being tested nobody wants to feed anybody we just want to do some magic we do i call it presentation anyway because the mini new testament ministry is not presentation it's revelation so but what we do today is that there is a lot of presentation and at the end of the day it makes a whole lot of local church look like a show that showmanship is the greatest signs of immaturity hallelujah okay let's look at verse 11 are you persecution afflictions which came unto me now paul was telling timothy persecutions why did persecution come to him because of the truth affliction why was he afflicted because of the truth which came unto me at antioch at iconium at lystra what persecution i endure but out of them all the lord was could you say deliverance deliverance within the context of doing the will of god deliverance in in the process of reaching people building them up that is a real deliverance hallelujah amen, amen. amen. i said that's a bible deliverance hallelujah it's not a deliverance that you lay hands upon people monday then wednesday you say the spirit has returned again and on friday you see you are still dealing with somebody for the past two months laying hands and it's still rolling both of you are not serious hallelujah and because what people think is that when they are doing the work of the ministry and a, lo a lot of people that say i'm a deliverance minister don't understand the, the deliverance ministry hallelujah the deliverance ministry is first a message let's look at luke chapter 4 verse 18 deliverance is a message first deliverance is a message and that message comes through preaching the spirit of the lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the broken hearted to preach deliverance to what to the camp so those who are captive what do you preach to them deliverance it is not doing deliverance it's preaching deliverance are you hearing me if there is a need to do deliverance it is not every time but if there is a need to preach deliverance is every time preaching deliverance is daily doing deliverance is not daily in a place a local church where the gospel is rooted and seriously established there will not be room for doing deliverance every day in such a church why because the people you are ministering to they are growing up they are what they are growing up through the preaching and the teaching of christ so the revelation of christ has formed in them power so that in your absence they can contend with the devil and overcome him hallelujah we don't use the deliverance ministry to grow a church it's a fake growth we use the revelation knowledge of jesus hallelujah to grow discipleship hallelujah because i will show you in scriptures people use deliverance and healing meetings to grow the church and when the pastor stop deliverance and healing service the church attendance will reduce they are never disciples in the first instance because the disciples of jesus are the people you raise through the teaching of christ so that they can also go and teach others also very important hallelujah and that is why you find out that 
a lot of things that happen in the church depends on the pastors. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? The proof of growth is discipleship. So when we begin to use the gift of the Spirit to draw attention to ourselves, discipleship ministry has finally stopped. And everybody has the tendency to do that. Hallelujah. When everybody is coming to you every time, and then there is no teaching that raises and builds them, then there is a problem somewhere. Praise God. Okay? Now, let's go back to our teaching because I want us to make very important notes. Shall we go back to that scripture we are reading before? Okay, Timothy. But that has fallen now, verse 12. Verse 12. Yea, all that we live godly in Christ Jesus shall do what? Shall suffer persecution. Which persecution are you going to suffer within the context of preaching the gospel? Teaching men, making them rooted in the will of God. The persecution will come. Now, everybody, look at me. I have never found a place where healing ministry translated to persecution. Because even in the book of Acts of the Apostles, when Paul and Peter, when Peter and John healed the guy at the beautiful gate, are you hearing me? They were not persecuting them. But persecution came because of the message that Jesus is Lord. That is where our persecution comes from. Our persecution is not coming because we are doing spiritual miracles and all those things. The real persecution is that because the message of Christ, hallelujah, it is the life wire of the New Testament ministry. So by the time we can do every other thing to interact with a Muslim guy, we can do everything, but when we come to him and say, Jesus is the son of God, he has problem with you because that message, the preaching of that message is what leads to salvation. And unfortunately, that message is what we have not carefully studied to know. If you see average of young ministers going to a mountain, what do you think they are going there to do? They want what? Power. Power to do what? To create changes. Changes to do what? To put Focus on them. Focus on them to make them a replacement of Christ. Hallelujah. So that when our Father in the Lord is coming, everybody will prostrate and then fall on the ground because we must not behold the man of God. That is the reason why they look for power. So I've carefully studied scriptures that throughout the New Testament, what causes persecution is not the manifestation of signs and wonders. What causes persecution is the message is worth now if you really want to find out let's look um, um, at one or two scriptures to confirm what I'm saying is the message that re actually results to um, is the message that actually results to persecution and if you don't have the message people can love you you may be a choice before me but the moment you begin to preach Christ, the crucified Christ, and the revelation of Jesus is being exposed, Satan is going to send people to attack you, to stop preaching about Jesus. If you preach about yourself, people will say, right on. You preach about Christ, no response. You preach about his death, revelation of his death, the manifestation of the embodiment of Christ, people say they are confused. They don't understand what you are saying. They can't understand because the God of the word has blinded their mind. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay, now let's look at Act of the Apostles. Um, um, chapter Act of the Apostles, chapter 5, from verse 1. Act of the Apostles, chapter 5. Um, Act of the Apostle, give me a place where the Sanhedrin, the, the, the religious group of those days, where, where they punished the disciples for preaching about Christ. I think it's Act of the Apostle. Is it four? It should be four. 
Um, let's look at five first. Verse. Okay. Um, okay. And they spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple. Act 4 verse 1. And the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came up on, upon them. Verse 2. Uh, being grieved that every that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Verse 3. And they laid hands on them, put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now even tide. Verse 4. How big many of them which had the word believed, <laughs> and the numbers of the men was about 5,000. Hallelujah. And it came to pass on the morrow that the, the rulers and the elders and the scribes, verse 6, uh, okay, and, uh, and Annas the high priest and the Caiaphas and John Alexander and as of many that were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem, verse 7, and they, were, and they had set them in the midst. They asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? And verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, You rulers of the people and the elders of Israel, if this day be examined of good deed, done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole. Verse 10, uh -huh. Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, doth this man stand here before what? They were not pointing anything to themselves. Am I right? They were not. They, they, they were pointing to Jesus. That is a ministry in the New Testament. Isaiah may not point to Jesus anybody, but in this New Testament, Hallelujah, that is we preach Christ and on Him crucified. Our focus is now on Him. Then we shift the focus of people on Christ. If you cannot understand that, you are not within the New Testament base. Everything burned by fire. The works we do for God in this testament we burn inside fire if it doesn't point people to Jesus. It will burn. It won't stand. It has no reward. So the anointing in Peter and John raised the man. Am I right? But it became a message for the Sanhedrin. You do understand what Peter brought a message out of it and hit those guys. And look at verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of corner. Verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of what? Of Peter and John and perceived that they were on land and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took at knowledge of them that they had been with whom. Now, you see, they considered them as unlearned people. That's revelation. It's very foolish to people. <laughs> revelation makes you unlearned to professors. But that is where the power of God rests. So the Sahendri sat down together, the, the body of a religious group, uh, hallelujah, and look at them very well. This thing these guys were saying did not correlate with what we know about the laws. So they look at them, they say these people didn't, they were illiterate and ignorant men. Who is ignorant among them? Peter or the Sanhedrin? Of course the Sanhedrin. So you see the message is a distinctive line between the foolish and the wise. The message. You must give attention to reading, to meditation, if you will last. Otherwise, you keep on changing like a million because you don't even know what Christ has sent you to preach. So therefore, we are of more performance than having understanding. I'll begin to show you some things now and how you go about them because it's very, very important. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, your, the fellowship of your calling exists in Christ. And uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. I want to bring you into this because I really want to explain uh, the importance of the doctrine of Christ 
I'm not saying the doctrine of the Bible. I'm saying the doctrine of Christ. There are a lot of doctrines in the Bible, but there is one doctrine about Christ. So that's when you find doctrines, you will find all kinds of teachings. But you will find doctrine of Christ is one teaching. But there are other doctrines. For example, that First Timothy 4 1 we read. Now let's look at the comparison. First Timothy 4 1 we read. There were we have the doctrines of um, let's give us first one. Now the spirit speaketh expressly in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith, giving it to sedition spirit, and what? Doctrines. Could you see plural now? Doctrines. But every time the Bible talks about the doctrine of Christ, it is it's usually what? Singular. Because there is no doctrines in Christ. It is the same. So what we have now is we will now go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. I want us to have interaction. The call of God upon us is without repentance. Hallelujah. And that calling can actually First Corinthians chapter 1 we're going to look at verse 9 that is going to First Corinthians 1 verse 9 that is going to be a tremendous help scripture says God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son Jesus Christ our Lord God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of the sons, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The fellowship we are called unto is the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. And that fellowship is very important because the fellowship you are called into begin from confession, believing in Christ. You are called into that fellowship. You are called as a participator, as, as a joint heirs. Hallelujah. Ownership, partnership. That's the fellowship you are calling to. Now, if the Bible says you are calling to the fellowship of his son, whatever the father has made the son to become, you have become. Because you become through that fellowship. You don't understand what I'm saying. Now, by marriage, if you have if you have built two, three houses, hallelujah, by marriage, by bringing your wife into, by marrying your wife, you have, your wife has also been called into that fellowship, into everything that God has made Christ to become. You have also, you are joined heirs in it. So the essence why Paul was now writing to the church in Corinth is to let them understand that um, Thanks be to God. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The faithfulness of God is that you didn't walk. You did not labor. You are not the one who died. You did not resurrect. You were not raised. For, uh, you were not the one who died. But everything Jesus had become, you were brought into that fellowship. So as he is, you are. Hallelujah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, as the heirs, joint heirs, you are joint heirs with him. Because that fellowship brings you into uh, that manifestation. You see, there, has, there is one thing about Christ that God shared with us. Jesus is the son of God, made manifest in the flesh. And you are son of God as well. Hallelujah. 
Now, you must also understand this important statement I'm about to make. Because the essence why you have been raised as a minister of the gospel of Jesus and as born again is that after Jesus died and resurrected, you become the proof of his power. So that Peter said, look on us. He was referring to who? He was referring to the lame man. That is the proof of the power. That is, Jesus who died and resurrected, hallelujah, ascended unto heaven. His presence is now in you. So that when they look at you, they behold Christ. In you, the hope of glory. That is the reason. So that everywhere you go, you will be pointing them to Christ that they don't see, but they see in you. Who healed this man? Jesus. Who raised this man? Jesus. Who delivered this man? Jesus. Where is that Christ? In me, the hope of glory. You will not be telling them he's sitting around one corner. He's in me. They are, for the anointing of the Holy One lives in me and I do not need anybody to teach me. But the anointing is able to teach me all things and it will bring me into the place of truth. So it therefore means that what taught Peter, as at the time he looked, that lame man was looking at them expectantly to receive something from them. What was talking to Peter? The abiding presence. The auction of the Holy One that lives inside Peter began to give Peter instructions. He said, look on us, silver and gold we do not have, but what we have we give you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. So the man started walking, but he points people to Jesus. Where is that Jesus that healed the man? He's in them. <laughs> That's why Christ in me, he is the hope of glory. Praise the Lord. I don't know, maybe somebody is excited what I'm saying. Now, this is very important because if you don't understand this testament, there's a lot of crises uh, that uh, people will go through. Hallelujah. You must understand this testament and what Christ has called you to do in him. So, shall we have that scripture again? We are still reading. If you can pop it up, we appreciate. God is faithful. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9. God is faithful to whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 10. Verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren. Now, now see, see, see here. Now I beseech you, brethren. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in what? In the same judgment, simply mean in the same interpretation of scriptures. Let's join together. That is, we have to agree on the major, and we may not agree on the minor. Now, what that means is this very important. Every minister of the gospel, every Christian, whether you are from Baptist, deeper like all kinds of denomination, we must come into agreement on the major aspect of our faith. For example, now, um, a congregation believes that wearing a trousers uh, for women will take them to hell. Some other congregation believes that if you are not wearing trousers, uh, wearing trousers is not a sin. That is not a major that's not a major. That's not a doctrine. Hallelujah. The doctrine of Christ is not the doctrine of trouser. That anything that does not concentrate on the revelation of what Christ has done is not major in New Testament. Is that okay? Because you must understand what is major. What is major in the New Testament is what we preach that saves people. So if we are in trouser, we deny people from going to heaven, then it's never a message of Christ. Because trouser did not die or lack of scare. Scare didn't die for your salvation. Hallelujah. So what we people find out is that instead of a believer, a minister of God who is called by God to learn Christ and grow up in the sound doctrine, they begin to look at things that are not substance in the faith. And they point to people as the changes that salvation has produced. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
I'm amazed because people do all kinds of things and that are baseless and they are not scripturally sound and it may look more appealing but it does not it's a form that's part of the form the scripture is talking about having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof if you see somebody who is not wearing trousers and he has 10 boyfriend then you look say how come you manage 10 boyfriend and we never see it on your face she has a form and that form is people are satisfied with the form but God said I need the power that I did not die for you to form I die so that the power of Christ can raise you from the dead and then can translate you back to life so we find this scripture is saying that that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment having a right interpretation for what is important in this testament do you understand what I'm saying for example when it comes into the issue of salvation what do we believe what do we believe when it comes to the issue of salvation and he did not reveal that unto us through the apostles this is not the time he will show us because the book has been closed and it says that woe is unto the man who added to what is already written so jesus will not go contrary to his word he will not give us something that is not there because resurrection of Jesus is the message of salvation. And every time you point men to Christ and men believes in him, then salvation comes. <laughs> Praise God. This is very important. I pray the Spirit of God give you understanding in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, right now, now, so he say, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing so we find out that um, one of the greatest errors young ministers make is that they want to grow a pattern of ministry outside the revelation of Christ that makes you force a criminal secondly it also puts you in the condition that heaven will not release provision provision can come from men but there are some things that God will not reveal because the Holy Spirit will not be a witness to what Christ has not done. It will never. The essence why the Holy Spirit is sent, one, the only reason the Holy Spirit is sent to the earth, are you hearing me? Is that everything Jesus wanted to speak to the disciples, they could not understand. And why they could not understand? Because it takes the indwelling of the Spirit to understand Christ. Christ cannot be understood in traditional context, cultural context, historical context. Just as Paul and uh, all the ap apostles were with him, they could not understand him until he left. So 2 Corinthians 5 says that from the time Jesus died and resurrected, ascended to heaven, we cannot know him anymore in the flesh. That if we are going to know him now, it will take revelation. And revelation is the discovery we have, we make in God through the word of God and the Holy Spirit. So the discovery we make in God is what we call revelation. So to know him now, we have to study scripture. There is nothing like this that a lot of people think they can know him because they are praying. The word of God has been given unto us as an instrument of revelation. So the more we focus on the scripture, the more knowledge of Christ we receive and the more testimony the Holy Spirit brings to what we already know. So the Holy Spirit came to reveal Christ as the truth. Now don't forget that Jesus is the way. Am I right? Is a means to reach the Father. That's the way. True, Jesus is the truth. The truth is realities. Hallelujah. Jesus is the truth. The truth is realities. The Holy Spirit is not the truth, but he is the spirit of the truth. Hallelujah. So the spirit that lives in you, what type of spirit do you have? The spirit that bears witness to the truth. Am I right now? 
Which truth? The truth the scripture is revealed. Which truth? The epistle of Paul the apostle revealing the manifold wisdom of God. Which truth has the Holy Spirit revealed? The truth that the scripture is already confirmed. So God anointed Paul to unveil Christ to us in this testament. Because he could not unveil himself. He said many things I want to speak to you but I cannot until the comforter comes. The paraclete the same of his kind. As quality as I am. But he is a spirit. He doesn't have a body. And he lives in your spirit. But if you have interaction with him through the scripture, he will unveil more of me to you. So how come we want to know Jesus? How come we want to understand Christ without fellowshipping with the word of God? Outside the word of God, there, there is no accuracy of Christ outside scripture. I don't care how many encounters you have. You cannot find the accuracy of Christ outside scripture. It is the scripture that bats the accuracy of Christ and the Holy Spirit testifies of that accuracy. So there is nothing that you fasted for 200 days. It doesn't bring the precision of Christ to us. Encounters is subject to changes. But the scripture has the attestation of the Holy Spirit. All scripture is written by the and for our reproof and for our instruction until the man of God is thoroughly fun. Encounters are subject to changes. But we have the truth of scriptures in the word of God. That is the deal now. So we have uh, three dimensions of ministry springing forth at the same time now. One, we have the legalism. Two, we have the extremism. And three, we have the, uh, the biblical ministry. The biblical ministries are not popular, but they are grounded and rooted in scriptures. The extremism believes all manner of the spirit. The legalism believes in the works of their hands. So the legalism is uh, promoting the works of the flesh and shifting the focus of people away from Christ. The extremism had interaction with spirits without a sound mind. So therefore they involve a lot of practices that are not rooted in scriptures. Because of the interaction they have with seducing spirit, the seducing spirit gives them a way of life that is not comfortable with scripture. So legalism, promoting the works of the flesh, extremism, promoting the operations of all kinds of spirit. But the biblical ministry is the ministry that springs forth, knowing Christ, unveiling Christ, and then feeding on the revelation of what Christ has done. This is important. And, uh, and I think uh, it is high time everybody is grounded and rooted in scripture. Praise God. I don't know, maybe you are still following me. All right? Praise God. Okay? Now, now let's look at um, verse 11. Let's look at verse 11. You, you find out scriptures. For it had been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of clue, that there are contentions what, among you. So, what are the contentions we have? The contention of personalities. Contention of what? And let me say this to you. There are about three major contentions that you must not let it spring forth in your local assembly or it must not also spring forth from you. The contention that happened here, the contention of personality, some said I'm of Paul, others said I'm of Apollos. Hallelujah. You say for Paul planted Apollo water, but God gave him Christ. So watering and the planting are the assignment in Christ. Could you imagine that? All the assignment, every ministers of the gospel, whether you are called as a preacher, teacher, evangelist, all kinds of ministry, music, drama, is the same thing in different ways. It's just like the sower went to sow. Hallelujah. What are they? What do you think the sower sow? Seed. So what is the seed? Christ. I see. I sing Christ. You teach Christ. You dramatize Christ. You evangelize, you disciple, everything within the context of Jesus. 
So when we find an assignment outside Christ, it's an assignment that deflects people. People are diverted to ministry that is not pointing them to Jesus. That is the danger of the ministry we are having now. And if you are, unfortunately, if you are also tracked into this, you are not helping things. And there is no how you are going to do it. You will go into scripture and find out truth. Don't give scriptures voices that are not in it. Don't bring interpretation of scriptures for your own advantage. Those are the level of the corruptions. Because the Bible says, Paul said, we do not handle the word of God deceitfully. Deceitfulness is handling the word of God with a corrupted mind. Remember I've shown you the corrupted mind because we have two minds that are custodians of scriptures. We have the sound mind that is a safe custodian of scripture. Then we have a corrupted mind, mind that has gone into interaction with the devil because the mind is not protected by truth. And because Satan has interacted with the mind, it has established some beliefs in that mind. So no matter what it preaches, it will raise money. Even in a meeting that doesn't need it, his mind has been conditioned to function that way. The devil has established beliefs and systems in the mind. So every time he's looking at scriptures, he's looking at what he wants to preach. It's not the message of Christ. And it will bring, and you know one thing about scripture is that you can find you there is a way you can say whatever you want to say using scripture to do what to back it up. That is a corrupt mind. That corrupt mind is a reprobate mind that does not bow to truth. And a lot of people have been in this business for 20 years disseminating teachings with a corrupt mind. They never blink their eyes. They have lost consideration. The spirit of the fear of God has left them. And a lot of people have been recruited into this type of ministry. Hallelujah. So the contention among them is the contention that was a shift from Christ. Are you hearing me? Yes, sir. The moment a shift, a focus, there was a shift from Christ. They shifted to the personalities. Oh, when Paul is preaching, man, come and see Revelation. Ah, what have you seen? Have you ever listened to Apollos? Apollos was sound, man. So now the church divided on personalities. And those hearers, they were no longer blessed. Because now Christ, who is the focus, has been taken out of the context. And Paul had to address that issue. That was the issue he was addressing in 1 Corinthians 11. Let's look at verse 12. And you have to protect your mind against intrusion of the enemy. For it had been declared, verse 12, Now I say this, that every one of you said, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Cephas means Peter, and I am of Christ. Verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Verse 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Verse 15. Lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. Verse 16. And I baptized also the house of Stephanas beside. I know not whether I baptized any other. Verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to do what? The gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of wealth. So what destroys the symbol of the cross? The power of the cross is destroyed outside the context of Christ. Because the scripture says that lest the cross, lest the cross of Christ should be made of wealth. What makes the, Christ, the cross of Jesus non-effect is because we are introducing the wisdom of men into the cross. I'll give you an example. 
if somebody said if you do not want to lose your firstborn you are going to pay firstborn offering so all of you who are firstborn here 50 15000 now they introduce the offering of the firstborn to the salvation that the cross of Jesus has produced for free so they do not let you see the free Done, that the cross has provided without human works. So if your firstborn didn't die, you won't say thank God. You will say I bless God because I paid what? I paid the offering of the firstborn. That offering actually rescued me. Now the wisdom of men begins to destroy the cross. They made the cross of Christ non of non effect and they don't come to this dimension of making the cross of Christ of non effect it's dangerous it's dangerous to attach things to what Christ has already done as a means of obtaining salvation now many people don't start this way but along the way their minds are corrupted and they begin to make terrible statements that makes the cross of Christ a non effect. Hallelujah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. You imagine if I want to tell you that if you need if you need long life here, the Spirit of God says we should sow fifty fifty thousand naira for our long life. The long life has been procured in Christ. Therefore, Pointing people to 50,000 makes the cross of Christ of none effect. It's not, you see, the gospel is not popular in this way. And you have to be rooted in scripture. Because if you are not rooted in scripture, there is a crisis. That's why people are not solid. They are not sound. They are not sound. They are carried away with all forms of doctrine. So we have to major, we have to come into agreement on the major and disagree on what? On the minor. For example, there is no any other name through which a man can be saved except the name of what? Now, that's a major. We have to come into agreement. Now, the minor is that if you call the name of Jesus 17 times, you'll be saved. Hallelujah. Are you understanding? Somebody said this is the revelation I received. You have to call the name of Jesus three times, Holy Ghost fire seven times before God saves you. Now that is a minor. The major is that there is a name through which we are saved. So we may not agree on the minor, but we must agree on what? On the major. If you don't agree on the major, you are not New Testament preacher. Because the New Testament revelation has shown us the major revelation through which we point people to Christ. And if you don't know it yourself, you will spend all your life on the minor, which doesn't point people to Jesus. The minor point people to you, the major point people to who? To Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? The minor point people to you, the major point people to Christ. I lay my hands on him. I cast out the devil out of him, the minor. Did you die for him? The major. <laughs> Amen. That you are casting out devil out of a man. Jesus made the power available through his death and resurrection. He said after he resurrected from the dead. He said all power from heaven and on the earth has been given unto me. Am I right? You just have a measure of the power. So if that is pointing people to you. And it's not pointing people to Christ. You have crisis. You are in trouble because you give account. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, let's, let's, are, are we, are we, are we here? Okay. Now, your calling is a function of the measure of grace you receive in Christ. And you must have fellowship with that calling. Your calling is the measure of grace you receive in Christ. And you must have interaction with that grace. You can grow in the grace. When the fellowship you have with the grace of God is very strong, 
you can grow in the grace of Jesus. So it therefore means that the calling is a means of revealing Christ to men. The call of God upon your life is a means of reconciling men back to God. That's what I mean. The calling is a means of reconciling men back to God. The call of God is an instrument, a redemptive instrument through which you unveil Christ to people. So the first thing that comes into the mind of a lot of people is that God has called me Otidobe. That's a corrupt mind. That is, the moment you find out that you have a portion in this ministry of the apostleship, the first thing that comes to your mind is that you want to ride a car. That is the corrupt mind. If you come into ministry work with the understanding that you are called and the next thing is to have a car, you won't make it. You may have a car, but you won't make it. You won't make it in him. You won't make it to heaven. Hallelujah. That's a reprobate mind. So the call of God upon your life is an instrument unveiling Christ to men in different form. Either a teacher, either a singer, either an intercessor. The call of God is a means of reconciling men back to God. And that call will unveil Christ from pages to pages. So if you don't understand what Christ has done and what Christ has done, if you, if you don't understand the mystery of his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and seated, which is his priesthood ministry, you can't preach the gospel. Because everything you preach is not gospel. Everything in the Bible is not gospel. Maybe you understand what I'm saying. There are stories. When Elijah was going up, Elisha dropped the Elijah. Uh, uh, Elijah took the mantle and he struck the water and he said, "Oh Lord God, where is the Lord God of Elijah?" Now that's not a gospel. That was a story of a man of God having the power. What does it produce? in Christ if you cannot find that scriptures if you cannot unveil Christ in that scripture then it doesn't relate in this testament <laughs> you don't understand what I'm saying hallelujah and Samson was in between two pillars and then he cried he said oh Lord God let me die with the Philistine if you don't have the understanding of what that means in within the context of the New Testament, and if you are coming to the altar to preach that alone on every Sunday, you will find out no man is growing in your church. It's an emotional message that steers them into prayer without unveiling Christ to them. And that is why this testament is the testament strictly growing in Christ, in the grace of God. And you cannot preach this except by... You see, that one is not revelation. <laughs> that one is not revelation. Hallelujah. The revelation now is the discovery of God in Christ. That's why people are not growing. For example, there is therefore now no condemnation to them in Christ Jesus, who walks not after the flesh but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Now, there is a law that is written in your spirit. That law that is written in your spirit is that you will know God yourself. And you will not need anybody to tell you this is God. That law is written on your new cre recreated spirit. That law of the spirit of life that sets you free from the law of do's and don't is in your spirit. Hallelujah. When you come to the place of fellowship with God. In Christ, that truth emerges. That truth is unveiled. Then as you behold him, you are transformed into the same image. The revelation of what Christ has done is what renews your mind. It's not the revelation of Elijah and Elisha. Hallelujah. That's why after some time when we listen to teachings, we become so aggressive. We're full of vengeance. Am I right? You feel like killing somebody. Amen. 
and the essence why you feel that way is because Christ that you be unveiled to you which is equivalent to the renewing of your mind that will produce the fruit of your new creation is not preached. That's why you are becoming aggressive and proud. That's why when you listen to some sermon, what comes out of your mouth is not edifying, it's not glorified. Now, but when you come to Christ and you begin to learn him and understand what Christ has done, and the Holy Spirit begins to testify of the truth. Who is Christ? That's where you see changes. It's noiseless. Because a plant grows without noise. But a tree falls with noise. Am I right? So you begin to see the noiseless. You begin to grow. And then, because you have been predestined in Christ to conform to the image of His Son. All what you are going through after salvation is conforming to Christ's image through fellowship with the Spirit. So if you yourself are not being transformed by the renewing of your mind, you have no ministry. Because you will replicate your life without the power of Christ. That's why some people will say, okay, now if you are going to preach, now somebody will make a statement and say, if you are up to 40 years and you are born again and you cannot pray for three hours, your life is finished. That's a very terrible statement. Because from which scripture do you draw three hours? Where is the grace of God? And how do we, how do we interpret grace carefully without depending on human words? So we have a lot of ministers of words that raises a standard of prayer life without finding true mercy of God. The mercy of God available for, it doesn't mean we should be lazy, but it also should not mean that we should raise prayer life into a particular standard where it negates the mercy of God. So I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God. The message of God is the standard of the love of God. The grace. You see, mercy of God, God comes down to your level, but the grace of God, he upgrades you to his level. That's the difference between the mercy and grace. Mercy is that God comes down to your level, incarnation of Christ. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes should not perish. God, the word made flesh by the mercy of God. But let, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. By the grace of God. So Jesus came down by the mercy of God. But we go up by the grace of God. Do you understand? If you could not find understanding of the New Testament preaching, there's going to be a pride. There's a crisis. So you've got to understand what Christ is doing. New Testament ministries is what? The calling of God upon your life is a means of revealing Christ. To people that is your assignment as a man of God okay now the question you will ask me is that uh, is it Christ who will be preaching alone is it Christ who will be teaching alone are we not going to teach about marriage you teach about marriage but with the revelation of Christ husband loves your wife as Christ loves the church so what is the standard of the love of a husband for the wife the revelation of Christ. Hallelujah. Wife, submit yourself unto your own husband. What is the essence? What is the revelation of the submission of a woman unto what? Christ. Hello? Okay. Are we not going to teach about finances? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, all other things. Everything we revolve around Christ. That is, that is why some people think it's boring. To teach about Jesus. What about the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the spirit that testifies to Christ. The spirit of truth. There is no comfort you can receive in the Holy Ghost. Except the comfort of the hope to be with Christ in the world to come. That is, if it is in this world, we have hope, we are most mystery. So therefore, the comfort the Holy Spirit is going to give you right now is that whatever you are going through right now, a time is going to come that the glory of God will be revealed in us. Having gone through tribulation, but a time is going to come that the glory of God shall be revealed in what? 
That is the comfort. That is the comfort the Holy Spirit is bringing. Hallelujah. Somebody lost a child. The Holy Spirit is not going to tell you that yeah, you will have your child tomorrow. No, that's not the comfort. The comfort is going to bring you is that if that child is born again, one day you are going to meet that child where in heaven. It brings you the comfort of the hope to come. Because people don't understand that they think that the Holy Spirit is going to do something outside what Christ has already done. The Holy Spirit does not have any other work than to confirm the realities of Christ in us. Why? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 9. Let's look at this very important. If you have this understanding, faith is taught within the concept of Christ. Finance, faith, teachings about marriage, ministry, everything must be taught within the concept of Christ. That is where you will have a balanced growth because it will shift the focus from you pointing people to Jesus. Okay, let me ask you a question. Why do you think you are starting a ministry? Now, there are a lot of guys who want to start a ministry. Now, if you come to me, you want to start a ministry, the first question, why do you want to start? Oh, I want to start this ministry because um, I feel God is calling me. No. The essence why God has placed a call upon your life is that the call of God is an instrument to reconcile men back to God. So whatever measure of ministry God has given unto you is to unveil Christ according to the measure of the grace you have. Hallelujah. So your fellowship with the grace, your interaction, that's where I bring out the topic, fellowship with your calling. The fellowship with the grace of God in you increases the gift of the Spirit man manifest. It is not having interaction with the gift. That is going to be a misconception about gift when you interact with the gift. Your fellowship is with the grace that made the gift available. And the more you are strong, you increase in the grace. You see the accuracy of the giftings. So God is faithful. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 1 verse 9. That is the essence why God has brought you into ministry. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So what is the fellowship of the son? The fellowship that the father share with Jesus, you've been grafted into that fellowship. And before Jesus died, he said, the works I do, you will also work. Because you've been called into that fellowship. The fellowship of joint heirs. Whatever I do, you will do, even greater works. What Jesus did was a master copy. He went into the music, um, um, what do we call it? He went into the studio and he made a master copy available. He used his own body to reconcile men back to God. We are raised into justification. Now, he said, preach the gospel. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you to the uttermost part of the earth. So what he gave unto us, he gave unto us ministry. Which, what is ministry? The mass what? Mass doubling. Mass what? mass doubling of what he has done. So we are not going to die for men, but we are going to unveil Christ to men for them to be saved. Because even though Jesus has died and resurrected and salvation is available, but they cannot come into salvation without ministry. So I am calling you into the work of the ministry to unveil what I have done to them so that they can believe in me. <laughs> Whether in a singing or in a prayer, in an intercessory, in preaching, in prophetic, and then that because things are getting out of balance. We can are we going to hold a meeting of five hours without unveiling Christ to people? Are we going to do program for six hours? And the understanding of what Christ has done, people don't the light of the gospel does not dawn on their heart. How are we going to do that? How do we measure an effectiveness of a meeting when the revelation of Christ is not given? We have a lot of people that enjoy the mysteries outside Christ. Mysteries outside Christ. Mysteries outside Christ is rubbish. Mysteries outside Christ 
is rubbish. There are three ministries, different ministries running concurrently now. One, legalistic, legalism. Two, biblical. Three, spiritism or extremism. The legalism is a ministry that sponsors the works of the flesh. The human strength equals salvation. So when they raise prayer point, when they preach the gospel or they preach, they let people see the human works as the most important than the salvation. Then we find biblical those that believe in the grace of God and they also believe in the labor of grace. Paul the Apostle said, it is not I that labor, but the grace of God. So, the biblical settings are the people who believe that the grace is available through the death and resurrection of Jesus, and they also believe in the labor of grace. That the labor of grace is this. That is, now that we are saved, we have to also labor for salvation of others through ministry work. So while you are interceding for people, while you are praying for them, while you are fasting for their family to be saved, you are laboring in the things of God to produce results. That's why the Bible calls us laborers. It says, pray you unto the Lord of harvest that it will send us more laborers. So we are laborers of the grace. Hallelujah. Jesus labored to bring the grace. But we are laborers, we are ministers of the gospel that unveil Christ unto men. And we will go through a lot of suffering to make that happen. There are some times we will not have money, but we have to make the scripture available, have to make Christ available to them. Then the other ones are the people that enjoy interaction with spirit outside the context of Christ. Now, the youth goes after the spiritism. The old loves legalism. And then the young men that are growing up who are hunger for scripture to know Christ and the power of his resurrection are staying in the balance. And then those who are biblical and they find uh, the interpretation of the scripture uh, they find the accurate interpretation from what Christ has done. That is how to grow. There are some times that we don't even forget. We even forget as if we are the one who did it. The labor of grace. The only work that grace carries is to work to make that grace abound to other people. So like Jesus said, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he said, and then he has given unto us the ministry of what? Of reconciliation. Remember that God reconciling men back to God. What did it take Jesus to reconcile men back to God? Jesus died. Propitiation. He was wounded. He was bruised. Am I right? What did it take Christ to reconcile men back to God? A lot of pains. Now that the reconciliation is now what? has been given as a propitiation. I have now placed a call on you with a ministry mandate to reveal Christ on what? Unto people. So somebody just spring forth in the body of Christ and said my own ministry is marriage counseling. And you are doing marriage counseling outside the revelation of Jesus. Hallelujah. You start teaching principles of marriage and without revealing Christ to them who is actually the truth about marriage. Hallelujah. Even in that marriage, you are legalistic. So another person shows up and said, my own ministry is a prayer ministry. Like I used to tell you, every minute believers in the New Testament is given prayer ministry. That is the reason why the Holy Spirit is given unto us to give us utterance. Utterance is a gift that empower us to pray and prophesy the will of God into existence. Why do you have the Holy Spirit? So that the gift of utterance are given to you to speak to God 
and also to prophesy about the things that God has said. So if you think as a minister or as a Christian, you will have to look for somebody, hallelujah, to see somebody who has a prayer ministry. You don't even know what you are doing. And for you also to think that you have a prayer ministry greater than any other person. If people don't come to me, they can't find fulfillment. You are wasting time. Hallelujah. Because the only person I saw in the scripture praying and fasting was doing that to behold Christ when he was born. Remember that a woman was in the, in the temple fasting day, day and night. And then when he fasted, God granted him, granted her favor. And when they brought Jesus into the temple, her eyes saw the salvation of Israel. Hallelujah. And since her eyes saw the salvation of Israel, he demanded God to take that. Because that's the fulfillment as far as he's concerned. He's been fasting for more than 60 years. Hallelujah. For a fulfillment of one day. So in the New Testament, we are given the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So that in the place of the fellowship with him, we can draw strength to pray and rest. Now, let me say this to us. I don't want to change this topic, but I want you to understand. In Isaiah chapter 11, the Bible says that it will grip us what the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, revelation, the spirit of counsel, might. Hallelujah. Are you hearing? When you come to Christ, when you come to the Lord, and the Bible says the veil is taken away. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit came Holy Spirit came with all those dimensions of spirit On the first day he came to you So the spirit of might is in you Ephesians 3.16 Hallelujah That it was training us with might By his spirit in what? In the inner man In the place of fellowship we receive that strength The spirit of counsel We have it The spirit of guidance is there The spirit of knowledge in the world We have it so there is no any other spirit coming after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, the baptism. The Holy Spirit has brought the fullness of God into you. And that fullness of God is the expression of the seventh spirit of God. You have it already. But just to interact with the word of God, then the Holy Spirit draws strength from the word into your spirit man. That is where we are lacking strength. That's where we are lacking power. The power you need, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. It is in waiting on him. It is in the fellowship of the spirit. There is a supply coming from the Holy Ghost in the place of fellowship. The Holy Ghost is not going to bring something outside Christ to you. That is why all things are yours. Don't let people rate you lower in Christ. In Christ, all things are yours. Why? You are joined here. That is how the scripture wants you to see this. And until your eyes are unveiled, you won't enjoy the provision available in Christ. Now, some people said, this is the season of the Holy Ghost. It's not a true statement. There is no season that is not the season of the Holy Ghost. Because every season the Holy Ghost testifies of Jesus. He said the spirit in you bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. So the greatest assignment of the Holy Ghost is to bear you witness. And that witness could be non-verbal or verbal communication. The Holy Ghost, you don't need to hear an audible voice to testify that you are born again. For what? If you are audible, what's fine. If you don't hear audible voice, he witnesses in you, you are a child of God. The law is written in your heart. The law of acceptance, the law of adoption, the law of regeneration. It lives in you. Do you make mistakes? So many. But you move on. Have you fought, have you have you messed up before? So many times. But you move on. The law is written in your heart. Hallelujah. So the law of legalism said, now that you have never committed sin this week, you see you are feeling good. And the devil say, okay, next week I'll be waiting. So next week you miss the mark. And then you are down again. Then the gospel of salvation we have received is not health syndrome gospel. That is, now God
God accepted me. I did something bad. The following day, he did not accept me. On the third day, he accepted me. On the fourth day, he's fighting me. Hallelujah. Jesus brought an end to such nonsense once and for all by using himself as God's eternal offering. And because you cannot be satisfied outside Christ, it is in him you live and you exist in him. So if a man of God, if a man of God does not have the understanding of this, what will he preach? Eh? He will be preaching fables. We are familiar with now. Now a pastor will say, "I know you are familiar with the story. What are we going to learn from this story? Nothing. Point one: the first point you are going to learn from this story: persevere. From this story, it is in Christ you learn. In Him you live, you move, you have your being. Does that mean we cannot?" Does that mean we cannot learn things outside the four gospel and epistle? We can learn a lot of things from there. But the first important thing is that our eyes are looking unto Jesus. Hebrew chapter 12 verse 2. Our eyes are looking unto Christ. Let me begin to unveil to you the importance of... You remember there are two, two, there are two doctrines now. I've anything apart from the doctrine of Jesus is a singular if you find any doctrine in the Bible associated with Christ is single if you find any other doctrines that is not associated with Christ is plural Hindu Guru Maharaj they have doctrine they live by doctrine they disciple people by doctrine hallelujah you understand any religion that does not have a doctrine will not last. Jehovah Witness has a doctrine. Muslim has a doctrine. Am I right? Hindu has a doctrine. Buddhist has a doctrine. Hallelujah. In Christ, we have a doctrine. And the only doctrine we have is the doctrine of Christ. So we have to study that doctrine to make disciples of all men. Otherwise, you cannot make disciples outside the doctrine of Jesus. You cannot make disciples from Elijah and Elijah series. You cannot make the <laughs> you can't make disciples from Adonija and Solomon. Amen. Amen. Because Jesus said, teaching them to observe everything I have won. And he did not teach them Elijah and Elijah. He wasn't teaching them <laughs> Zechariah and Zephaniah. So to make the disciples of all nations, we have to strictly abide with the doctrine of Christ that Christ has taught them. That is how to make disciples. That is how to make what? Disciples. Am I teaching? Matthew 28, Mark 16. He said, teach them to observe whatever I have commanded you. So that what you have to do, go back into scriptures and find out what is commandment, what he has shared with us from Matthew to Mark, Luke, John, then you attach that one to the epistles of Christ. Because everything that Jesus has commanded them, now there is an extension of Jesus' teaching, and that is the Pauline epistles. So Pauline epistle happens to be the epistle that unveil Christ in the full standard. Because Christ could not explain himself to them. So he said, I have a lot of things to share with you, but now I could not. But when the Holy Spirit comes, it will illuminate your mind. I have now raised a man called an apostle, an apostle to Gentiles, who will also add to that which I have what I have commanded you. Begin to focus on that teaching to make disciples unto all men. That's why we are making hypocrite people, we call them leaders. Because the only thing we have taught them is to serve us and not Jesus Christ. And that's why people have in a form of godliness, but they have no power. The power is not in the form. The power is in the teaching of the word of God. And that teaching will impact them a way of life. Because every doctrine of Christ will provide a way of life. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the essence. I don't know. The Boko Haram, they are going through doctrine. You think it's easy for somebody to carry a bomb and blow himself? He has gone through a proper doctrine. 
it can take them six months to continue teaching him the other side of Quran bombarding him with teachings and trainings and telling him that if you blow yourself you guy you will see 15 virgins and he believed because once belief comes upon what we hear it produces power do you understand the power that people are having a form of godly deny the power once faith rest upon what you have had it will produce power and the power it will produce is not to fall under the anointing it is a power of transformation that is disciples teaching people until you make them to teach others hallelujah so going through a proper discipleship cannot manifest outside conviction, conversion, confession, and conformity. Conviction, conversion, confession, and conformity. A true disciple had conviction about the beliefs of Christ. He went through conversion, a change of, a change of approach, a change of perception. Then he goes through confession, publicly confesses that Jesus is Lord, that I am the disciple of Christ. Then he went through conformity. That conformity is very, very important. Hallelujah. Amen. It is important we understand that the conformity is there. That's why Paul was telling them, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God <coughs> that you present your body holy and acceptable unto God, which is what? Your and be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, transform simply means you are fully conformed to scripture to the teachings of Christ the way of life, the manner of Christ the beliefs and the understanding of Christ I think this is going to help us in time like this look at Hebrews 12 verse 2 he said looking unto Jesus the altar and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endure worth do you know the reason why he endured the cross? So that the power of the cross can save men. Hallelujah. He said the message of the cross is foolish to those who perish, but to those of us who believe is what? Is the power of God. The power of God is that the message of the cross is a power of salvation. So he endured the cross, despising the shame. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of what? Of God. But how do we do it? Looking unto what? How do we look unto Jesus getting the teachings about Christ, unveiling Christ to people? Get out of the way and let them see Jesus. Also, if you have the manifestation of the gift of the Spirit, it is a sign that points to Christ. Listen to this, this is very important. If I raise a dead man, will he not die again? Eh? If I raise a man, who, who, a, a dead man, at the age of 60, at least if the man spent more six years, will he not die again? There is no permanence in science. There is no permanence in miracles and deliverance. Because one day, those you deliver and those you don't deliver will die. But what do we have is that we point men to Christ, who is the author of eternal salvation. Do you understand what I'm saying? You are not hearing me. The John and Peter said unto that man, look on us. Silver and gold we do not have. What we have, we give you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Am I right? So what did they give them? They gave him what they have. What do they have? They have Christ in them, the hope of glory. So when that miracle draw attention around them, what did Peter did? Peter pointed back to Christ. Because that was just a sign that would point men to Christ. But if you that sign draw men unto you, you are no longer a true disciple of Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory be to Jesus. Now let's go and do this work. Let's do it very well. I want to ask you a question. All of you here and those who are watching online, if you are a pastor, you are a young minister, ask yourself this question. What do you really think that drives you the most? 
to be easily seen or noticed. It's a spirit that must die in Christ. You understand what I'm saying? And for that spirit to die in Christ, your flesh, remember, the Bible says your old man has also been crucified with Christ on the cross. And the reason why your old man is crucified with Christ on the cross so that you can be alive in righteousness in the new man. The new man that you have become also carry fruit of divine nature. And you have to nurture that nature to produce fruit. That fruit is the renewing of your mind. That fruit is the renewing of what? That fruit is the renewing of your mind. It is very important. So why we point attention to self is because we have not found Christ. Or we have not learned Christ. Because as a young minister, as a minister of the gospel, we have four major roles in Christ. One, we have to know Christ, which is salvation. We have to learn Christ, which is discipleship. And we have to grow in him, which is maturity. And we have to serve Christ, which is service. That's ministry. The, the last cycle in Christ is serving him. But that's the first thing people want to do. Because the place of service will reveal the act of your work. So if you are serving and you have not known him, and you have not grown in him, and you have not understood him, that is a problem. Your service won't be acceptable. Show man, show of hypocrisy. Hallelujah. Are not the true signs of discipleship. Now, I'll give you an example. There are things we need to learn. In fact, the way I'm dealing with things now, I'm going to have to uh, create a class and call, because we do not speak wisdom among those who are not mature. What I'm sharing right now, because for you to have an understanding of a subject in Christ, are you hearing me? It will take a normal church service for, to, 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 to explain a subject in the New Testament will take at least four hours. So if we run five services between seven to twelve, where, is, where are people going to grow? Because the true discipleship is not raised in haste. What we do is not discipleship. We just find something to feed them, but it doesn't satisfy them. Because the nature of Christ must be fed in us through the word of God. So that we continue to grow up in him. That is where we draw the strength and the power from. Hallelujah. Okay, so now... We close by five, and I promise you, we close by five, and we go. I hope you are blessed. Are you sure you are blessed? As a minister of the gospel, your spiritual growth is the development of your spiritual life. Your spiritual growth is what the development of your spiritual life. And when we talk, when we want to talk about your spiritual growth as a minister, it is the influence the word of God has in every area of your life. That's the growth. Hallelujah. And the growth in Christ is different from... Because when I said, for proper growth, you have balanced diet. Am I right? You will have uh, carbohydrate, what other thing? Uh, protein. But in Christ, there are no classes of food. Christ is the meal. It's the bread from heaven. Whether it's milk, whether it's meat, whether it's bone, it's Christ in different dimensions. As what? As a newborn babe desires spiritual milk that he may grow thereby. First Peter 2 21. So even in Christ, our growth is predicated both on the milk, the meat, and the bone. And I will show you what milk is. The milk aspect of Christ, they are the elementary doctrine of Jesus. That is the intake of because your inner man, you are just a new creation. And a new creation cannot just take a full revelation of the wisdom of God. So you have to begin from what? From milk. And that milk is for the newborn babes. Those who are just born again. They have to go through elementary foundational class. Hallelujah. The foundational class 
has a mixture of excitement and concern. But it's full much of goody goody. Hallelujah. Our God is good all the time. Praise the Lord. God is good. That you come to a time when you will hear something like, What shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation. Ah, ah, tribulation. Okay. Shall persecution. Peril. In all these things, we are all kidded long as a sheep to be slaughtered. In all these things, we are more than conqueror. For we are now, for I am now persuaded. You see, persuasion? You see, persuasion is not for babes. Hallelujah. Persuasion is not for those who are growing up. That is, you have come to the point that nobody is monitoring you. If they don't monitor you for two weeks, you mess up. Because you are babes. You litter the ground. But now you have grown up. You have grown into responsibility. Hallelujah. For I am now persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor principality, nor power, nor things to come, nor things absent, will be able to separate us from the love of what? So the full maturity in Christ is life driven by love. Not service. By what? By feeding men without holding camera in your hand. Some people have not outgrown that nonsense. It's nothing bad, but it is also a sign of non-spiritual growth. That you give someone a pair of shoes, you are just taking camera with him, is not bad, but you are not growing up. That you want to give 200,000 to church in the church and then you bring it out before all men is you are not growing up. So God still loves you. Remember, you know my manner of life. Paul the apostle was writing a letter to Timothy. My pain. Now one of the fruit of Christ is patience. And we have to be patient with us until we grow up. But you have to outgrow that on time so that your service will not be controversial. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory be to Jesus. I don't know, maybe somebody is still following me. So we have seen all tendency of growing into legalism, extremism, spiritism without biblical standard. And then it does not matter your deep interaction with the spirit without sound doctrine, you will fail. Your failure is, the days of your failures are numbered. Because you will sleep with ladies, anointing will still flow. It is in the place of the doctrine of Christ that you will understand that each time you sleep with a stranger, something is missing in your life. You will still be having confidence in the spirit, but you lack understanding, the accurate interpretation of scriptures. Somebody said, well, I have slept with a lady, our pastor didn't, un could not design it. Does that mean God loves me? He doesn't. He loves you, but he doesn't like that. And until the day HIV will discover you, the pastor will be surprised himself. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. Now, now, so, now, when we now talk about our growth, the first thing that comes into our mind is that lack of, lack of understanding about growth is also what is pushing us into legalism. In Christ, there is no protein nor carbohydrate. Jesus is the one. We are being fed with Christ to grow up spiritually. Hello? Remember Jesus is the bread that came from heaven? Remember that the revelation of Christ is what feed us? Now, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17. I want you to understand. Let's see what feed us. And then we, we close by 5. I, I hope you are blessed. Yes, ah, good. Good. Uh, these are wholesome teachings. These are sound doctrine. There is nothing we can do about it. I can't be gathering you around and be feeding you with all junks. And you are shouting and then don't know you are dying. Now, from verse 16, let's look at, I will talk more on this tomorrow in church service. You know, we have three online services tomorrow, and there is a place of it transformed by the renewing of your mind. How to guide your heart against demonic interaction. You see, your spirit produces thought. Do you understand? And the thought, the fellowship of spirit produces thought. That is why those thoughts are called inspiration. They are called what? Inspiration can be of God or of the devil. Hello? Hello? Coronavirus is around. Somebody is just inspired. Take this up, take this up, mingle it together, give it to somebody, and the person is okay. There is a spirit that has interaction with the person. And the person somehow call it, do it together, it pro and then you see once interaction comes with the spirit, it produces inspiration. When the inspiration is released, it becomes a template. Other people start copying it. 
but somebody got inspired of it. <laughs> you understand? Kekena Pep, somebody was inspired. Other copied. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? Microphone, somebody was inspired. Other copied it. So the first person who got the inspiration is a pioneer of that thing. So our human spirit has the ability to interact with unseen forces. But when the interaction takes place, as a Christian who is sound in the Bible, the moment your interaction comes with those spirit to produce a thought, scripture will disqualify it. If it is not scripture. Are you hearing me? But for those who don't have a sound mind, as it is dropping in their heart, they are taking action. And they will say, God said, I should give you the talk. That when you drink the talk, you will be okay. Worry, talk, talk. Okay? You, God said, I should give you. Now, they have interaction with the spirit. Their spirit is unguarded. Because they are not sound in scriptures. And because the sound mind has not been given, they, they have not developed a sound mind. So the interaction with their spirit produces inspiration. Inspiration produces instruction. They carry out the instruction. It produces action. But we, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, for God has not given us the spirit of what? Of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. So the spirit of power to create changes, priest of sound mind to give accurate interpretation of scriptures, understanding the will of God, and the spirit of what? Love, affection to the things of God. Colossians 3 verse 3, set your affection on the things on the above. You cannot set affection without spirit of love. Otherwise, if love is not involved in you, they will drive you to death. You won't be able to do things willingly. My people shall be willing in the day of his power. So the willingness to do it is a driving force of love. I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you what spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him verse 18 the eyes of our understanding being enlightened that you may know what is what the hope was what you know the meaning of that the hope of his calling is that the reason why he came to die for you what has that death produced in you because the death of jesus and the resurrection of jesus gave you a hope <laughs> Hallelujah. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in what? So now as a born again child of God, you are growing up. The moment you begin to grow, you will understand the glory of the inheritance of the saints in the light. You will understand the riches of what? The glory of his inheritance. And then what is the, the hope of Christ calling? Why did Christ come? What has that become in you? Hallelujah. Amen. The salvation you have received, what has it translated to? It is in the place of studying scripture you understand all this. As you are studying this scripture, your eyes are unveiled. Confidence in the finished work of Jesus begin to develop. Then you, are, you understand what I'm saying? Then more of, you, more of him, less of you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Then you do not know flesh glory in his presence. There is nothing to boast of. Paul the apostle said, if I have nothing to boast of, I say everything I count what? I count everything lost for what? For the sake of Christ, for the sake of the gospel. You have nothing to gain. You have nothing to boast of because in the revelation of Christ, he has taken away your pride. He taught it not to be equal, to be, to be equal with God. He became what? He was, he was brought in the fashion of a man and he learned obedience, even obedience unto death. That's the same thing you go through. And therefore God highly exalted him, giving him a name that is above every other name. That's what you are going to go through. That is the effect of learning Christ, knowing Christ, growing in him, serving him. That's what he's doing in your life. So when you see somebody that is fake visions or fake revelations, all kinds of crazy things, demonic interaction with the mind, guide your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. This is very important. Okay, I say have 20 minutes more. Okay. So, our growth Hallelujah. Amen. Our growth is in learning Christ. Because as we are beholding him, we are transformed 
into the same image. What image do you transform to? Christ's image. And then the fruit of the new man is made manifest. All the place of your struggle is no more. You cannot do without pornography. You don't even know when last that has happened. Because it's no longer in your power. Hallelujah. The excellency of power is now of Christ and not of me. Because the, the treasure lives in the earthen vessels. This is very important. If we have this understanding, we will be able to help people and then we will help ourselves. If you go back to that scripture, it says, Give attendance to reading and to meditation. For in doing this, you will save yourself and them that hear you. And if we cannot do that, if you cannot save yourself, you won't save those who are hearing you. Because doctrine of the scripture, having understood the doctrine of the Bible, will help you to save yourself and to do what? And to save those who are hearing, hearing you. Impatience is one of the fruits of undeveloped spiritual life. Because growing takes time. Growing takes what? Growing takes time. A mechanic boy that is showing another person's workshop who has not who has not taken gained freedom. He's still learning from a master and he has opened a workshop. You understand? That's the generation we are now. You understand? A mechanic, an apprentice, who is learning mechanic, who has not attained the place of freedom. Is using is 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 opening a shop. What is lacking in that guy? Is patience. Hallelujah. Is patience. Is patience. Every other person will deny you, but accept me. He look at him. He say tonight, so that you will not say it's a mistake. The cock will crow. Is it two times or three times? But you will deny me two times. So that we will not equate you to the strength of a cock. Cock will do his own two, two times. You do your own. So you will follow the rhythm of the cock. And the Bible says when they asked him the third time. And Peter began to curse himself. And when you look at the face of Jesus. He wept. Because when he denied Jesus. He was actually out of fellowship with Christ. Yes the Bible says if you deny me before Man, I would deny you before my angel. Do you know if it, Peter was <laughs> Peter lost fellowship with Jesus? As at the time Peter denied Christ, he was no more with him because he did it three times. So for Jesus to bring him back into the fold, he asked him question three times: Lovest thou me more than this? He said, I love thee. Lovest thou me more than this? I love thee. Lovest thou me more than this? I want. So for each denier, he regained back through confession. You don't understand what I'm saying. How many times did he deny Jesus? Three times. How many times did Jesus ask him again? Do you know the reason why Jesus asked him again? Because through confession, he, he was brought back to the fold. He was outside the fold. So, lovest thou me, I love you. Lovest thou me, I love you. Lovest thou me, I love you. The denier of Christ before the, the, the Roman soldiers brought Peter out of fellowship with Jesus. But confessing his love brought him back. Then after he was brought back, he was commissioned with a responsibility, feed my lamb. So every young minister must feed himself. And then you must feed others. But if you don't feed yourself, you'll be preaching yourself. And if you are preaching yourself, they will be learning yourself. And when they will be learning yourself, all of you will be growing in self. And Christ is not revealed. There is nothing that underrates the redemptive work of Jesus like pointing people that Christ has died for to yourself instead of Christ. God hates that. And Jesus is not even pleased either. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. So now the fellowship we have, we share with the Holy Spirit. Is that the Holy Spirit brings truth about Christ. Write it down. 
truth about your identity in Christ. I want to, though I have a lot of things I wrote here, but I can't, you know, I won't be able to go over anything. Truth about Christ, truth about your identity with Christ in Christ, revelation of Christ in you. Those are the things that grows your spirit. Revelation of Christ in you. So spiritual growth is the influence the word of God has brought into your life. Spiritual growth is the influence the word of God has brought into your life in knowledge, in understanding, so that Christ is made manifest in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, every time we talk about the doctrines, doctrine is teachings. And we have three, the doctrine of men, the doctrine of Satan, and the doctrine of Christ. You can find these three doctrines in a church. But you, in a local church that is growing in the wisdom of God, the only thing you will find there is the doctrine of Christ. But there are local assembly where they have the doctrine of men. The next time we are going to come together, we focus on this aspect of doctrine. The doctrine of Christ, which is Christ in me, the hope of glory. The doctrine of men, and we have what we call the doctrine of Satan. How many doctrines do we have now? Doctrine of men, doctrine of Christ, and the doctrine of where? Then we have the doctrine of God, which is theology. The doctrine of Christ is Christology. Hallelujah. Then the doctrine of men is legalism. Then the doctrine of Satan. So, 1 Timothy 4 says, uh, giving it to seducing spirit and the doctrines of what? So, seducing spirit confirms the doctrine of the devil in a man. The doctrine of the devil is very, very large. Hallelujah. Very, very large. Few of them you see. Look at verse 2 of 1 Timothy 4, verse 2. Um, um, Paul explained little of them, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience sealed with a hot iron. Verse 3, forbidding to what? To marry, commanding to abstain from myth, which God had created to be received with thanksgiving of them, which believe and know the truth. So, the doctrine of the devil, these are not the only doctrine of the devil that Paul mentioned. Paul only mentioned few ones out of many. Buddhist, Hinduism, and all those things are the doctrine. Because the doctrine of the devil brings a man into fellowship with Satan. Every doctrine will bring you into fellowship. Doctrine will bring you into what? As I'm teaching you right now, you are coming into fellowship with Christ through this teaching. The Holy Spirit is witnessing inside of you. You understand what I'm saying? Every doctrine will bring you into fellowship, interaction. What I call fellowship, interaction and participation. Some of you, after you listen to the word of God, God will impart instructions in you. God will confirm revelations in you. You never can tell what will happen after each time you listen to instructions. Hallelujah. But you see, we have the doctrine of men from the falling of Adam, when the first Adam fell. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And then they came to the doctrine of men. He said, from today, uh, your mind will always come to your husband and then you will till the ground. And it will produce for you and you will sweat that is the doctrine of men believing in the, that is the works of your hand will be the proof of your existence hallelujah and they labor 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 until the time of abraham god dealing with abraham became in covenant so god said i want to make a reversible commitment to this guy and these are the rules of the game and then we went out of that then they came into what they came into the laws and then they went through the laws they came into prophet by Isaiah so we, we have more of prophet than the laws then they came to Christ and when Christ came he said come to me all you that labor labor where? labor under the doctrine of men I'll give you rest and what 
is that rest? You will inherit. <laughs> you will inherit my rest through my own finished work. So I will walk, you will rest. So let me go and do the work. He died on the cross. Then we rest in what he has done. And then how do we activate it? Believing and confessing. And then we obtain salvation. And after we have obtained this salvation, what do we do? We begin to grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. We begin to learn Christ. And the Holy Spirit begins to illuminate our mind. Giving us revelation, bearing witness, and agitating us on the inside to strengthen us. That is what we have to learn now. That is the focus of the New Testament. That is what I'm doing, everything I'm laboring day and night now to bring some revelations of Christ into operations. In fact, You must understand the fellowships of your calling. This is very important. Let me just stop here because all what I just feel is the doctrine of Jesus. Are you hearing me? Started from him. Teaching men to observe whatever I've, what I've commanded them. Then that, doc, that teaching of Jesus started from Christ. But the disciple could not take more because the Holy Spirit has not come. When the Holy Spirit came, the Bible now turned that doctrine of Christ to Apostles' doctrine. Remember, Apostles' what doctrine? Apostles' doctrines are the discovery the Apostle made through the revelation about Christ. And they also instructed all the disciples to teach others. So they made the discovery of Christ by revelation. Apart from what Christ has taught them, they also made discovery. Jesus didn't tell them to go from house to house directly to share communion. You understand? Hallelujah. They made that discovery in him. He didn't tell them how scary in fellowship. Take prayer meetings to all houses and teach them. They made discovery of that in him. So the apostles' doctrines are the discovery of the revelation of Christ apart from what Christ taught them directly and then they combine Jesus' teaching Matthew, Mark, Luke and John apostles' doctrine to make disciples to do what? So making of the disciples is unveiling Christ to men and then we also commit the same teaching to them after they have learned Christ and they have understood and grow in him. Then we commit them to the same ministry. That is the same thing I'm still saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that Jesus Christ, God reconciling men back to God then he has given unto you ministry of reconciliation. So we are laborers of grace. Jesus labor to make grace available. We labor to distribute grace. Do you understand? Because ministry is a means of unveiling Christ unto men. Ministry is a means of reconciling men back to God. If your ministry is not reconciling people back to God, you have no business in New Testament. Christ must be unveiled. The length, depth, and the breadth, and the height of Christ. So you must study him if you are going to reveal it to me. And you must know him just like Philippians 3.10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and worth. The fellowship of his suffering, what the suffering of Jesus uh, has produced for us. And then my part in that fellowship, I must know it. The apostle knew their part in that fellowship. They suffered. Hallelujah. Let me give you an example. Let me close with this. Remember that the mother of Zebedee, John and James, they came to Jesus Christ. Do you remember? What did they say to him? She said, I want two of this, my son. One to sit at your right hand, the other to sit at what? 
And Jesus said, okay, it is not within my power to do that. Number two, can they drink of the cup that I'm about to drink? How many of you know that after Jesus Christ died, the first person they killed among the apostles happens to be the brother of John? I didn't know. Maybe, maybe he was already, maybe he has already partake of that cup. And God deliberately speared John because of his too much love for God. He will have died as well. Because that day was also hanging on his neck. His brother has gone now. Phew! Maybe he took off the cup. You see, if you are asking for something you don't understand, you're asking for trouble. Because in Christ, we have full understanding of what we... Understanding is the life wire of Christianity. A man can suffer for 15 years without understanding. That's why Paul said that the Father of our Lord Jesus will grant unto you the spirit of wisdom, Sophia, insight into realities. Then, and the spirit of revelation, apocalypsis, unveiling Christ. That discovery you have about Christ through the word of God and the revelation of the spirit is what? Is, is, is revelation knowledge. So revelation knowledge is available for us to know Christ, not in the flesh. Not in the flesh anymore. There is no history in Jerusalem that can save any man. The revelation of what Christ has done is a, is a revelation that we need. That is what grows your spirit. Now, let me say this. Revelation will inject your spirit man to produce faith. Faith cannot be produced until revelation enters your spirit. And when faith comes, the dealings of God is birthed in a man who has faith in Christ. So when you say, I confess Jesus as my Lord and my Savior, I believe he died for me and all my sin. And the Bible says, with faith, with confession, confession is made of the salvation with a heart, man believes. The moment faith comes into operation, are you hearing me? The dealings of God begins in your life. And the more of faith, the more of the increase of the capacity to know Christ and to handle all things pertaining to you. Give him praise and magnify him. Say, Father, we bless you. Can you play that keyboard for all? Can you prophesy and speak right now? I feel in my spirit something is, is already revealed unto you in Christ today. Lebra mazozo preke le mazaba, le preke zende le mazozo boshide, le mbre le mozande le braga zanda la mama seke le mali le boso. Come live in me, all my life, take over. Come breathe in me, I will. Scripture 
and learn this know it i'm speaking to you as i'm as paul spoke to timothy learn give attention to reading and meditation understand scriptures read bible if you are reading bible now read the entire chapter understand the context and avoid fellowshipping with seducing spirit because we have two minds corrupted mind and sound mind sound mind is in christ hallelujah but we we we, we read the word of god we read the word of god to increase our capacity of handling the word of god correctly we must not twist scriptures we must not handle it deceitfully and we must not desire to do anything for god without knowing him it's, it's demonic god is not looking for sponsor he needs sons and let's learn christ hallelujah father thank you tonight for the word we thank you for spirit of grace we pray that you will deepen this truth in our heart we will not have a form of godliness and denying the power thank you precious lord in jesus name